Now that we're up in the main. Davis five. I was counting. I missed. I was missing one head. Who's that? I wanted to see this, so we'll get this. What are you gonna do now? Ready? You sure? You're positive. also called a muzzle loader, but more frequently it's called a flint lock. This little stone that I'm barely touching with my finger is a piece of stone, a piece of flint. And when flint strikes a piece of steel, it causes a spark. When that spark occurs, when I pull the trigger and this hits the steel, some of the powder I put out here in the pan ignites and makes a pop, but you don't hardly hear that because most of it goes through a tiny hole inside the, the musket, and that sets off the powder that's in there, which pushes the bullet out. So this part that holds the flint is called the lock. And this part of the musket is the stock, and this part's the barrel. So you have the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel. That's where that expression comes from. And right now, this lock is back at half cock in the first click. And if I pull on the trigger, nothing happens. So there's another expression, don't go off half cock, because nothing will happen. I have to pull that all the way back. Now, in order to fire this, in my pouch here, I have a paper cartridge. It's a paper tube and normally there would be a round lead ball in the bottom of the tube. But I don't have a lead ball in there today because here at the museum we have a boat ride down there a little bit later and those people get awful excited if I shoot real bullets at them. So we don't shoot real bullets right here. But there would be a lead ball, and then there would be a measure, correct measure, of powder in here. Not enough powder, then the bullet would not come out of the barrel very well. If I have too much powder, this gun could blow up, and that wouldn't be very happy either. So I have the right measure. And in order to load this, I have that long tail sticking up, and I bite off that tail, put a little bit of that powder in the pan, put the rest of the powder down the barrel. Now at this point, that lead ball would normally be there. The lead ball is just a little bit smaller than the bar inside of the barrel. So the paper makes it fit really tight. So we push that down, and then to make sure everything is sitting way down at the bottom, we use a rod and push everything down. All right, now this whole thing is loaded and ready to make another noise. Are you ready? Yes. No. Yeah. We'll go back like this. Okay, let's see if we can get a spark. <laughs> okay, my turn again. My turn to talk. Uh, in the old days, in the 1830s, there would be quite a few of these muskets around because here in the state of Massachusetts, we had a very active militia. And by state law, 
every young man from the age of 18 to the age of 45 was in the militia automatically, with the exception of ministers, they were excused, Quakers, they were excused, the uh, sheriff and his deputies were excused because they had to keep law and order, and mentally incompetent were excused. But everyone else had to show up on Militia Day, usually twice a year, spring and fall. And they had to bring a musket, a bayonet, a cartridge case, a canteen, a knapsack, and two extra flints. That's a natural stone and it can break if you're not careful. So you have to add some extra flints. I have an extra flint or two right here in my pouch. All right, so a lot of people had these muskets. Can we see if it'll fire again? Yeah. Okay. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what we do with the muskets when we're not in the militia. Okay, we'll put a little powder in the pan. And then we'll close the pan. Put a little powder down the barrel. And then we'll pretend we have a bullet. And we'll ram everything to the bottom. And remember to put the rod back, otherwise you may not be on the fire another time. Okay. All right, time to make noise again. Now. A lot of people had muskets, as I said. So when they weren't, when they weren't in militia, they might do some hunting. Now, one thing you have to think about in the 1830s, a lot of this land was very cleared land. There were fewer trees back then than there are today. Because to a farmer, a tree is a weed, it's in his way. And he cuts it down for firewood and so on. So with cleared land, there's very few deer. So there's not much deer hunting. There's no wild turkeys left. But there are other things that make fresh meat. Remember, you don't have refrigerators, so, or freezers, so your, your meat mostly is very salted or it's dried or smoked or preserved in some way like that. So fresh meat would be really nice. They hunted rabbits, they hunted squirrels, they hunted the old favorite woodchucks. <laughs> you know the woodchucks don't eat wood. They eat mom's flowers and they eat the tops of all the vegetables and they eat clover. And they have a back door that's usually hidden and your cows or horses could step in that hole so they weren't very well appreciated. And a good, fat, juicy woodchuck makes a nice meal. Okay. They also hunted birds because instead of a single pellet, you could put in a lot of little BBs, a lot of small bird shot down there, and they hunted passenger pigeons and creatures like that. Okay, we'll do this one more time, just to make the noise. <laughs> smooth bore? That's a smooth bore, right? Smooth What's bore? On the musket? Smooth bore on the musket? It's a smooth bore. Yeah, when did the yeah. rifling come out? No, not rifling. Uh, this is like a shotgun. And uh, the cost of this weapon in the 1830s is about $13. But that's like two weeks' work for a tinner, or a whole month's work for a man working in the factory. Kind of expensive. Now, you could buy a rifle with rifling, in the, but it was just about twice as, uh, as costly. It was close to $25, $30 or more. Okay, for a rifle. Now, accuracy with this, with that bullet, with that round uh, ball in there, from right here, I think I could hit that green door 10 times out of 10. 
But I might not hit the church up there if I shot at the church. At that distance, that bullet is going to float like a knuckleball. And it'll go right or left, high or low. You don't know where it's going. That's why battles were fought closer than from here to the bank. Yeah. All right. Remember what they said at Bunker Hill, using this kind of a weapon. Don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. You got to be pretty close to see the whites of somebody's eyes. Of course, some of those soldiers had their eyes wide open. Some of them had them closed. Okay, we're going to fire this one more time. Make a little noise so we go. Okay. Sometimes I a little delay. This goes off and then there's a front sight, but no rear sight. So it's sort of a point and shoot. You can't really make an accurate aim. How long will the flint last? 